Awesome. So welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to tonight's session, uh, Introduction to Prostate Cancer and Primary Treatment Options. Uh, tonight, we have Dr. Babish Collisar, who's the urologist for tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Michael Peacock. He's a radiation oncologist from BC Cancer. Um, and we have Dale Gamble, who is a patient representative, and he's going to be talking to us tonight about his experience with prostate cancer. So the Prostate Cancer Supportive Care Program um, is a program that's uh, designed to provide supportive care as well uh, for both patients and partners from the time of initial diagnosis and onwards. Uh, this is both a supportive care program and a research initiative. So we do a lot of uh, research within our program trying to understand clinical outcomes. Um, and the way that we work in our program, we use a set of modules, uh, and each module has a theme. So in total, we have six different modules, and I'll go into that um, later this evening and let you know what we offer. Um, but most modules in the program include a preemptive and educational theme, and patients really just choose modules of interest. So we'll definitely direct you to some uh, modules that we think would be very beneficial to you, but it, ultimately the decision is up to you. Uh, we believe that knowledge is empowering and education se uh, sessions do help uh, answer questions and alleviate stress when it comes to decision making and just going through the whole um, prostate cancer diagnosis. So the PCSC program, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is comprised of six different modules. Uh, introduction to Prostate Cancer and Primary Treatment Option is this session this evening. It's, like I said, it's our longest session. Uh, managing the Impact of Prostate Cancer Treatments on Sexual Function and Intimacy is our Module 2. Module 3 is a Lifestyle Management Module, and it encompasses exercise and nutrition. Module four is recognition and management of treatment-related side effects of androgen deprivation therapy. This is a module specifically for patients who are going to be going on hormone therapy. Uh, pelvic floor physiotherapy for bladder concerns is module five, and counseling services is module six. So this evening's presentation, we're gonna cover the following, the anatomy of the prostate, um, and really what does it mean to have prostate cancer? Um, we're really going to go in and tell you how we grade prostate cancer, what are the different risk levels, low, intermediate, high risk, uh, and then the physicians will uh, talk about both of the treatment options, so surgery and radiation uh, therapy, what are those different types of therapies that they have uh, for each of the treatments, and all of the possible side effects and what to kind of expect going through the treatments. So it gives you a really good opportunity to be really well informed about the decision that you're going to be making in terms of treating your prostate cancer. Uh, once we've done that, um, we're going to be going through uh, individual discussions with both the urologist and radiation oncologist. You'll have about five to seven minutes to speak to both of the physicians, um, and we'd like to try and keep to that so that it doesn't um, go for a very long evening. Uh, but you'll be able, they'll have a, a copy of your biopsy report with them, and you'll be able to ask them any questions uh, regarding your particular prostate cancer. Um, as that's happening, um, I'm going to be delving into what other modules that we offer in the program. And anything that you miss uh, while you're out with the physicians, uh, everything's in your handout, and if there's anything that you'd like me to go over, I'm more than happy to do so. Uh, once that is done, we're going to invite Dale Gamble, who's going to, who is our patient representative tonight, and he's going to talk to you about his experience with prostate cancer. He's actually prostate cancer free for the last 25 years, so you know he'll give you his experience and what he went through and and how he's doing today. So with that uh, said, I'll introduce you to Dr. Babish Kolasar. Thank you, Vanita. Um, so, I'll start by talking a bit about the anatomy of the prostate and prostate cancer. Yeah, um, so we'll go a bit about uh, what men who have been diagnosed with localized pr prostate cancer need to know about the prostate gland, PSN as a diagnostic test, as well as prostate cancer staging. So, this uh, diagram illustrates anatomy of the prostate. You can see that it lies below uh, the bladder which is here, um, behind the pubic bone and in front of the rectum, and it surrounds the urethra. What do we know about prostate cancer? We know that it is a very common disease. It grows very slowly in most men, and the most common risk factors for prostate cancer 
as most of you would know is age. The older you are, the more likely you are to have prostate cancer. There's also an ethnic component, so Africans are at higher risk of having, uh, of having prostate ca cancer, much more so than Caucasians or Asians. Uh, if you have a fir first degree relative with prostate cancer, that also puts you at a higher risk. And there is some emerging evidence that diet and obesity might be associated with prostate cancer as well. So how common is prostate cancer in different populations? By the age of 70, one in every two African men will have prostate cancer, uh, one in every three Caucasian men, and one in every five Asian men. In the majority, however, this will either be undetected, nor will it be uh, symptomatic at the time of death. What is PSA? Um, PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. It is a protein made by the prostate gland, and it can be measured through a blood test. PSA, along with additional rectal examination, is currently the best available way that we have to, to screen for prostate cancer. PSA has led to a, a much earlier detection of cancer than in past decades. We know that it is an effective test uh, for following up the disease in men diagnosed with prostate cancer. And in patients with prostate cancer, measuring PSA will be an important part of your follow-up going on. How do we assess localized prostate cancer? It's by way of staging and grading. Staging means how extensive the disease is locally, and grading means how aggressive does the cancer look under a microscope. This is a, the T staging of, um, of prostate cancer, which has been a bit summarized. So T1 means that the tumor itself is not palpable. It is limited within the prostate. T2 is a tumor that's palpable on rectal examination, but still limited to the prostate. T3 is either a tumor that has extended beyond the capsule or involving what we call the seminal vesicles, which are those structures here. And T4 are involvement of adjacent organs. So this is a T staging in a little bit more detail. We won't go through much of that. And prostate cancer grading. So grading, prostate cancer grading was developed by Dr. Gleason, hence the name Gleason grade and Gleason score. What the pathology looks at is basically the two largest sections of cancer in the specimen, and they assign a grade to it, which is between three to five. The grade indicates how aggressive the cancer is and how fast it is likely to grow and spread. Uh, the Gleason score is obtained by adding up the two numbers for the most common and next most common cancer, which gives an overall Gleason score. So for example, if your most common one is a Gleason 3 and the next most common one is Gleason 4, your overall score will be a Gleason 7, 3 plus 4. Other information that can be gathered from the pathology report. Um, so usually we take around 12 calls during the biopsies. Some patients may have more calls, and some patients may have a little bit less calls taken. The length of the positive, uh, positive portion within each call is indicative of the size of the tumor. And also, um, the distribution of positive calls can be indicative of the size of the tumor itself, and whether you have a unifocal tumor or a multifocal tumor. So some patients have, well, most patients actually have a multiple focus of prostate cancer within the prostate gland. Also, if we find that um, the positive cores are close to the margin of the gland, from a surgical standpoint, it will make you a bit less likely to have a, a nerve sparing procedure. Risk group stratification. So we would divide patients into low, intermediate, and high risk group, depending on certain criteria, which we'll go through now. Um, the risk group stratification helps us as phys physician to advise you as to which treatment option will, will fit your case better. Um, first is the low risk, uh, low risk group. Your PSA should be less than 10, ideally. This is not an absolute requirement nowadays. Uh, however, your Gleason score must be less than 6. And options available to you are active surveillance, which is the uh, most appropriate modality in those cases, but also prostatectomy and radiation modalities. Intermediate risk group, PSA between 10 to 20, again, or a Gleason score of 7. 
or on clinical stage, uh, a T2C, meaning a tumor that on rectal examination involves both lobes of the gland. Primary treatment options would be prostatectomy and radiation uh, modalities, but there's a small proportion of patients in whom active surveillance may be an option as well. High risk group, PSA is more than 20, Gleason score between 8 to 10, T3 or T4 on uh, rectal examination. Primary modalities, again, radical prostatectomy um, or radiation, man radiation modalities. This is usually used in combination with hormones, and a minority of patients may, uh, may need hormones only. So what is meant by um, localized prostate cancer? Um, it is when the cancer itself is restricted to the prostate gland only. It means that the cancer is treatable and hence potentially curable. Most patients with localized cancer um, have a, a disease that's slowly evolving, which gives us some time to choose a management strategy. So I'll talk a little bit about active surveillance and prostatectomy. Uh, we'll go for active surveillance first. So what is active surveillance? It's, it basically means that we're not really treating you for the time being. It is appropriate in patients with low-risk disease where the cancer is unlikely to spread or reduce the life expectancy. Um, it, it is also appropriate in patients who have other health problems, uh, which may be more significant for them. The main, main advantage is that um, it avoids or at least delays dealing with the side effects and risk of treatment. So how is the patient actively surveyed? If you're placed on an active surveillance protocol, you're going to see your urologist regularly, every three to six months. Uh, we're going to do a rectal examination and check your PSA. All patients on active surveillance require a confirmatory biopsy within 18 months of diagnosis. Then uh, possibly every two to four years. However, this is not an absolute rule. There's currently an emerging role for MRI to guide our biopsies. And um, most of you, if you are being treated in, in our center, will have an MRI prior to your second biopsy within 18 months. So those are two um, pictures illustrating a normal prostate on MRI and an abnormal prostate on MRI. Um, the abnormal area that we see on the picture on the right-hand side will, can be used to target future biopsies. When, what determines when treatment is necessary. So patients with a rapidly rising PSA, or patients in whom we did a rectal examination and we <coughs> find it to be more suspicious than initially expected. If on your repeat biopsy, we, found that we find that there is increase in the tumor volume involved, or there's a higher grade of cancer that we, that we discovered. Very rarely, patients with suspicious finding on MRI may also be taken off surveillance protocol. And more importantly, if it's your choice, if you're not comfortable going ahead with active surveillance, then radical treatment measures are open to you. I'll talk a bit about prostatectomy as well. So prostatectomy can be a treatment modality suitable in any risk disease, as long as the cancer is confined to the prostate. There should be no spread of, um, of cancer uh, this means your CT scan must be clear and your bone scan must be clear. The patient must be fit for surgery. These must be able to have a general anesthetic and the patient must be agreeable for surgery. What do you have to expect prior to the prostatectomy? All of our, of our patients have a preoperative consult with an anesthesiologist. Uh, you may be invited to participate in some research studies and all our patients have some blood work done as well as ECGs and chest x-ray to make sure you're fit for surgery. Where is it performed locally? It's performed here at VGH, also at UBC Hospital and Mount St. Joseph. If you're treated here, you'll stay on the fourth floor of the Jim Pattison Pavilion. So how is the surgery done? Um, two main um, treatment modalities, I would say, open surgery and robotic surgery. Uh, you should know that in terms of oncologic and functional outcomes, uh, the uh, randomized control studies haven't shown any difference between the two. Common features to both of them include a general anesthetic, and a nerve sparing procedure is possible in both of them if the tumor is not too large or near the edge of the prostate. Um, so those 
pictures illustrate the incisions for um, a radical prostatectomy and a robotic prostatectomy. So the picture on the left hand side of the screen shows uh, incision for a radical prostatectomy. This is a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, so your actual incision will extend for, from four finger breadth below, below your umbilicus up to your pubic bone, which is probably around half of what you're seeing here. And uh, the Da Vinci prostatectomy, you have five small incisions made on your tummy. Um, you can expect to stay overnight in hospital. Um, it is usually associated with minimal to moderate discomfort. Um, the great, great majority of our patients go home on Tylenol and uh, Advil. You have a catheter in place for around seven days. And depending on what type of work you do, you have uh, three to six, you need to take three to six weeks off work. The advantages of a prostatectomy is that it's well co tolerated. Uh, we also sample lymph nodes uh, during the procedure to check for spread of disease. The prostate itself and the lymph nodes are assessed by a pathologist, and we have more information in terms of prognosis, which can, which can be reassuring for many patients. Uh, having a prostatectomy will also prevent you from suffering from, the, from urinary problems associated with aging. Again, uh, in terms of cure rates, the results are excellent. We can combine a radical prostatectomy with additional radiation for se very select patients with high-risk disease, and there's a low risk of life-threatening complications. The main issues with uh, surgery inc include uh, a certain proportion of patients who suffer from incontinence and erectile dysfunction. So erectile dysfunction is seen in around 50% of men having a nerve sparing procedure. Incontinence in our center, mild incontinence in our center requiring a safety pad per day is experienced by 5 to 10% of patients. Uh, less than 10% of patients actually require a blood transfusion. Less common side effects include severe incontinence in less than 1% of men. This can usually be corrected by a surgical procedure. Blood and scarring is seen in less than 3% of men, and rectal injury at our center is very, very rare. Um, so the Da Vinci surgical si system, uh, I'm sure you've all heard about it. Um, it's basically uh, the surgeon controls the robotic arms from a console. The advantage is that uh, it allows 3D visualization of the operative field, and it also allows very intuitive movements for the surgeon himself. Um, so you can see the surgeon will be sitting at the console and he'll be directing the movements of the instruments while moving his hands at the console. Again, uh, I'll have to stress that in terms of oncological, meaning cure rates, and functional, meaning incontinence and erectile dysfunction outcomes, there's no difference between an open technique or a robotic technique. Yeah, yeah that's about it. Uh, Dr. Peacock, I'm a radiation oncologist at BC Cancer, just down the street at the Vancouver Center, uh, and I'll go over some of the radiation treatment options for uh, prostate cancer with you today. Uh, there are two forms of radiation treatment, brachytherapy and external beam radiation. Uh, I'm going to be covering brachytherapy first. Uh, so just uh, in general, uh, what radiation therapy is and how it works is uh, radiation is high energy x-rays. We use those x-rays to damage the cancer cells and we target the DNA of the cancer uh, and the processes that uh, give rise to cancer are uh, mutations and, uh, in, uh, and defects in the ability of the cancer to repair those mutations and we exploit that with the radiation by causing lots of DNA damage so the tumors end up uh, dying off while the normal tissues have the capacity to repair themselves from the radiation. So brachytherapy is a way of delivering radiation treatment internally. Uh, brachy comes from the Latin for short so the the, the distance that the radiation travels from the seeds is very short, so we really concentrate the dose of radiation in the prostate gland itself by depositing all these seeds. Uh, we use uh, computer software to design a plan specific for each man because everyone's prostate is shaped uh, a bit differently uh, and the size varies uh, quite a bit. 
uh, and the number of seeds that we implant, uh, we implant the whole gland, it's really dependent on the size of the prostate gland, not necessarily the aggressiveness of the prostate cancer or the size of the tumor. Uh, and there are two types of uh, the brachytherapy. Uh, I was mainly talking about LDR or the seed implant, but there is also another type of brachytherapy, HDR, which I'll cover a bit later. So brachytherapy is offered at a number of centers uh, at BC Cancer. Uh, so there are six centers in total, and most of us are offering brachytherapy for men with prostate cancer. Uh, so a number of locations in the Lower Mainland. Uh, it is offered in Surrey as well but they share an operating facility with Abbotsford, so the actual procedure is done at Abbotsford. So who's brachytherapy for? It's for patients, uh, when we use brachytherapy on its own, uh, for patients with low and intermediate risk disease, uh, which uh, was covered a bit earlier. For patients with high risk disease, we often do some sort of combined modality treatment. Uh, treatment that, that we would um, usually recommend is a combination of external beam radiation therapy followed by a brachytherapy procedure usually two to five weeks after. People that uh, would be eligible for the brachytherapy in Vancouver generally under the age of 80. Uh, once you get above the age of 80 we have to weigh the risks of the procedure against the aggressiveness of the cancer uh, and in most cases it seem, might seem a bit aggressive to offer a patient brachytherapy uh, if they're in their mid-80s for example. Uh, there is a limitation in terms of the size that we can implant. Uh, the, the opening for the pelvis varies from man to man but if the prostate is too big I can't get the needles out far wide enough to adequately cover that area with the seeds. Uh, and so sometimes if the prostate is too big, we might give uh, patients a, a short course of medications to help shrink the prostate down uh, before the implant. We know that urinary function, poor urinary function is predictive of having problems after the procedure. So people with a lot of difficulties, particularly problems with obstruction or weak stream, uh, uh, trouble emptying their bladders, this might not be the best treatment for them uh, because of the side effects, and we'll go over those in more detail. Uh, and uh, as we've kind of been alluding to, for uh, most of you, you have a decision to make. There are a number of really good treatment options uh, that you have, and there's differences in terms of side effects that you'll have to balance out and, and what is acceptable to you. So this would be a, something that you would have to choose to have. Uh, this is a, uh, an illustration of a patient having the procedure. We use the same ultrasound probe that uh, you might be familiar with from the biopsy, uh, except uh, here the needles which uh, contain the seeds are going through the skin, not through the rectal wall, uh, through a template grid that's attached on top of the ultrasound. So we design the plan, uh, we know where the needles are supposed to go and how many seeds are going to be deposited in each location throughout the prostate. And uh, here's just another 3D schematic of that, uh, of that uh, procedure again. All the seeds being deposited throughout the prostate gland here in red. So if after today's session, if you haven't met with a radiation oncologist uh, yet and you think this might be something that uh, is of interest to you, uh, then you can request a consult with one of us. Uh, if, um, if you still want to go ahead, we'll get you to see one of our anesthetists to make sure that they would feel comfortable giving you either a general or a local anesthetic for the procedure. We do an ultrasound uh, before the procedure to make sure the prostate is of appropriate size and shape. And then we order the seeds um, from a company in the States who preloads the needles for us. That usually takes about three weeks to have the seeds shipped across the border and uh, for them to get to us, uh, so we usually schedule your procedure about three to four weeks after that ultrasound appointment. Uh, and then the follow-up, the PSA, while there's a lot of controversy about how good PSA performs as a screening tool, it's a very good sensitive marker after you've had any type of treatment for your prostate gland and following the response of the cancer to that treatment. So we check the PSA every six months for the first two to three years. And then once things start to stabilize uh, every, um, 
uh, I usually do every six months for as long as it uh, is medically appropriate. So it's a day procedure, so there's no overnight stay in hospital. Uh, we do it under a general or a spinal anesthetic. Uh, the procedure itself takes about an hour to put in all those seeds. You wake up in a recovery area with a catheter. Uh, it usually takes about a couple of hours t for the anesthetic to wear off. Once you feel like you're able to pee, we take that catheter out, do a quick CT scan just to confirm that none of the seeds have shifted, and then you go home uh, that day. And uh, most patients, there's a little bit of discomfort in the area where the needles are put in, maybe a little bit of bruising. There shouldn't be any significant bleeding. Uh, and people are usually resuming all of their normal activities within a few days. Sexual function is actually pretty good uh, in the couple of weeks after the procedure. Most patients who are sexually active before the treatment will continue to be sexually active. Uh, and uh, we have now been doing prostate brachytherapy here in BC for since 1997. Uh, and we have uh, good long-term data to show that it is a very effective treatment for prostate cancer. The most common side effects are irritation to the bladder and the rectum. So it is uh, very common. Uh, most all patients will have some irritation to their urinary passage uh, and they'll uh, report some <coughs> increased frequency of urination, urgency, slowing of the stream. So we usually say irritative and obstructive urinary symptoms. About 5% of patients may need to have that catheter which we put in during the procedure and then uh, take out before you leave. They might need to have that reinserted. In general, that if we do have to put a catheter in, it's just for a few days uh, until some of that inflammation from putting the needles in wears off. Uh, most patients will return to their baseline urinary function, but about 15% of patients will have some persistent uh, chronic changes to their urination, generally mild, but some patients may have more difficulty emptying their bladder uh, on a more permanent basis, uh, usually due to some scar tissue that can form in the urinary passage or a stricture. Uh, there we might have to ask for help from one of our urology colleagues to go in and do either uh, dilate the tissues there or uh, resect some of the tissue there to open up that passage again. The bowels will also get irritated, so within a few weeks and uh, lasting for a few months, patients may notice some increased need to have a bowel movement. Uh, they may notice uh, some minor rectal bleeding, which is generally uh, self-limiting. Uh, if they do have more persistent bleeding, uh, one of our uh, colleagues uh, from uh, uh, gastroenterology will go in with a scope and use some superficial laser treatment to get rid of any um, uh, bleeding vessels. Uh, in the area right behind the prostate. Uh, one of the more significant complications is a one in 500 risk of causing a hole in the rectum uh, from the radiation damage, and that would be a big complication where patients would need to have surgery and would likely end up with a, a bag that collects the stool permanently. But fortunately, very rare. Uh, sexual function is uh, generally uh, pretty well preserved with the brachytherapy. Uh, it does depend on the patient's age and, uh, and erectile function before we start treatment, whether you're already taking medications like Cialis or Viagra. Uh, so for a patient under the age of 60 with good erectile function before treatment, not taking any medications, there's a 80% chance of them preserving their erectile function at five years. Uh, but uh, as uh, patients get older, if they're already having uh, erectile difficulties, then that chance um, goes down. So the number of seeds doesn't depend on the aggressiveness of the cancer. It really depends on the size of the prostate. And even though your biopsies may only be positive in one location in the prostate gland, we know that it's only a sampling and when uh, urologists perform a prostatectomy, there's often cancer found in other parts of the prostate. Uh, so we implant the whole gland uh, as well. Um, now the half-life of the seeds, so we use, um, in Vancouver we use a, a, a radio, uh, an isotope of, um, of iodine. 
the half-life of those seeds is about <coughs> two months. So we usually say that patients are, they, you will be temporarily radioactive. And uh, oh, the dose to anyone around you is fairly insignificant. Uh, you know, we let patients, you know, travel, they leave the same day. There's no, we don't have, keep them quarantined or anything. But we do ask patients to take extra precaution around young children and pregnant women for the first couple of months. And if you are traveling, particularly if you're traveling to the States, they do have radiation detectors at the border. They're very used to patients having radiation as part of a medical procedure. So they, but they will ask you some questions, take you into secondary, and that may add an extra hour to your travel time. So just something to be aware of. If you are planning on taking a flight, they wouldn't want you to miss your flight. The high dose rate brachytherapy, it's a little bit different. We're not implanting any seeds. We're still putting needles in, but instead of seeds, we're running a high energy source into those hollow needles and uh, delivering the radiation all at once. So with the seeds, you're being, the radiation is being slowly delivered over a, a year. With the high dose rate uh, treatment, we're delivering all the radiation in one session. Uh, so usually over a couple of, uh, the radiation, radioactive source is only in the needles for uh, less than half an hour, uh, but it's all in one day. Uh, so the advantages of that procedure are is you're not permanently, you're not temporarily radioactive, you're only, the radiation is only on when the source is in, uh, in the tumor. They were either doing one or two insertions for this, uh, this type of brachytherapy. It's not widely available at the present time. Uh, it's only being offered in Kelowna right now because they have the equipment and the expertise to deliver that treatment. Uh, they are not doing it uh, outside of a clinical trial. So one of the reasons why centers either offer one or the other uh, is just that uh, more just the expertise with one. We don't know that one type of brachytherapy is necessarily better than the other, uh, but in Kelowna, they're comparing the side effects of uh, both of those types of brachytherapy to see whether there is one that looks like it's better than the other. From our experience with HDR, which isn't as, uh, isn't as long as LDR, but, but still has been being used for quite a while, uh, it does look like it is a very effective treatment as well for prostate cancer. Um, and again, uh, available in Kelowna and uh, uh, also in um, uh, Toronto and, and uh, Montreal or other places that do HDR. So that's brachytherapy. Uh, any questions about brachytherapy before we move on? Okay, so the other type of way that we deliver the radiation is externally. Uh, using a large x-ray machine called a linear accelerator. So almost uh, all different uh, risk groups can be treated with external beam radiotherapy, so low, intermediate, or high risk. Uh, one of the uh, advantages of the external radiation is that uh, if you have contraindications to an anesthetic, if you've had a bad experience with an anesthetic in the past, or you have other health conditions that may make an anesthetic more uh, risky, like significant heart disease, uh, then you do not require an anesthetic to have external beam radiation treatment. And some people will go through the side effects, but some people uh, don't like the idea of having an anesthetic or anything invasive uh, done to them, and they may prefer to have <coughs> external beam radiation treatment. When we look retrospectively at patients who have had brachytherapy, similar patients who have had external beam radiation, it does look like, in our experience, the brachytherapy is a little bit better uh, for controlling the prostate cancer. But I think both are good treatment options, uh, depending on how you weigh the risks and the benefits. So with uh, low-risk prostate cancer, we usually use external beam radiation alone. For intermediate risk uh, prostate cancer, we may combine the external radiation with hormone therapy, uh, or and if you have multiple intermediate risk features, we might do external beam radiation and a brachytherapy uh, implant, or we call it a boost. Uh, for high risk patients, we uh, do a combination treatment that we call triple therapy, uh, usually 12 months of hormone therapy, 
uh, five weeks of external beam radiation treatment, and then uh, two to three weeks later, a brachytherapy boost. And uh, that approach has uh, been shown to have uh, very good uh, cancer control outcomes. So there are some patients who uh, cannot have external beam radiation. Because the radiation has to pass through your other tissues to get to the prostate, which is uh, kind of in the center of the body, uh, there are some bowels that may be affected by the treatment. So if you have a history of inflammatory bowel disease, that would be a relative contraindication to having external radiation. Uh, the body remembers having radiation treatment, so if you have had radiation treatment to this area in the past, we may not be able to give um, a high enough dose. We may uh, damage some of the tissues that have already had radiation uh, in the past. And uh, if you've had an extensive pelvic surgery before, a lot of scarring and other things, the radiation treatment may uh, further contribute to scarring in the pelvis and, and that may lead to other complications. So that might also be a contraindication to doing the radiation. Uh, if this is something that uh, sounds uh, appealing to you, or if you want to explore some of your other options, uh, again, you can meet with one of us at the cancer, uh, at BC Cancer, uh, and all six centers are offering uh, external beam radiation. <coughs> so again, we use uh, machines like this called uh, linear accelerators, where the patient lies on a couch and the machine rotates around and delivers those high energy x-rays. You don't see anything, you don't feel anything, there's no pain, there's no uh, burning. Uh, it's just like getting a CT scan. Uh, the machine makes a, a bit of a buzzing noise. I uh, will often do an image before your treatment to just verify the consistency of your bladder filling and your rectal, uh, your rectal filling and that the prostate is in the right location. Uh, and before we do the external radiation, we do a CT scan. At that appointment, we'll put on some tattoos so that we can line you up in the exact same position for each treatment. And external beam radiation, one of the downsides is it's not terribly convenient. Patients have to come in Monday through Friday. Depending on the schedule, sometimes we're doing 20 treatments, sometimes we're doing uh, 40 treatments, uh, up to 40 treatments. Uh, each treatment taking about 10 to 15 minutes. Most patients uh, are in and out of the building within 40 minutes. And uh, we are, most of our machines have built-in CT scanners. We usually do a quick CT scan before each treatment. Uh, just another check to make sure that everything is in the right location. Uh, and that has helped us reduce the amount of normal tissue that's being treated because we have now a, another a way of verifying the position of all the tissues. Uh, so it's CT-based planning, uh, you know, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty much like common now, but it didn't used to be 20, 30 years ago. So if you have, if you're meeting people who have had external beam radiation many decades ago, things have improved significantly with advancements in imaging technology and computer technology. Here's a picture of a radiation plan, uh, and here's the prostate here uh, in the middle of this picture, and uh, we call these isodose lines, and so these isodose lines really kind of hug the prostate with a small margin, and we're able to kind of carve or paint the dose out of the rectum and the other uh, tissues there to help reduce side effects. So it, it depends on what risk group you're in. Sometimes we may also target tissues around the prostate uh, or target the, uh, the lymph nodes around the prostate where there might be uh, microscopic amounts of cancer if, uh, if we think that there's a risk of there being um, cancer in those lymph nodes, we'll include them. For many patients, we're just treating the prostate gland with a margin. So it's outpatient treatment, there's uh, no anesthetic required, less urinary side effects compared to the brachytherapy, but uh, uh, sometimes more rectal issues. Uh, and side effects typically resolve a few weeks after the conclusion of the radiation treatment and generally start about two to three weeks into the radiation treatment. 
And for patients who it's very important for them to continue working during treatment, uh, we start treatment at 8 in the morning, we go till 6 uh, in the evening. Uh, we can generally accommodate some of those requests uh, to schedule your treatment either first thing in the morning or end of the day. Uh, so fatigue is the only uh, general side effect. Otherwise, it's very similar in terms of irritation to the bowel and the rectum, frequency of urination, uh, bowel cramping or diarrhea, and there's usually some medications that we can give you to help manage some of those side effects. Uh, and generally, things start to resolve within a few weeks after the treatment. The chances of causing erectile dysfunction long-term are very uh, similar to the brachytherapy. Usually say about 50% of men will have some erectile dysfunction at five years post uh, external beam radiation. Uh, sometimes um, uh, people have some chronic issues with urinary frequency or urgency uh, and rarely um, bleeding from the bladder, uh, which uh, may need to be addressed by a urologist. And then rectal bleeding, uh, so sometimes people can have a couple of drops uh, in the in the stool or on the toilet paper, and uh, gastroenterologists will have to go in, have a look, and just uh, use a laser to uh, take care of any small bleeding blood vessels. With the external beam radiation and with the high-dose rate brachytherapy, the radiation is only on when the machine is on. Uh, with the LDR brachytherapy, you are temporarily radioactive. The seeds uh, are, um, the radioactive material is encased in uh, titanium casing. So those seeds stay in there forever. If you do an x-ray, you will be able to see those seeds, but the radiation uh, material kind of burns itself out after uh, a, a period of about a year. Thank you. So I'm gonna continue on um, and let you know what else our PCSC program offers. So I mentioned earlier that we have six different modules in our program, and <coughs> now I'm gonna go in uh, and talk about each of them. So the second module is called Managing the Impact of Prostate Cancer Treatments on Sexual Function and Intimacy. Uh, this is a really good session that I strongly recommend every single patient and their partner attend. Uh, so this is an education session about the sexual side effects of treatments and options for dealing with them. Uh, we have a sexual health nurse uh, who delivers a monthly education session talking about the side effects from the treatment, so erectile dysfunction. Um, at low libido if you're on androgen deprivation therapy uh, and they talk about all of the options that to help you regain um, erections and they also talk about sex, uh, penile rehabilitation which is making sure you're getting blood flow into the penis and getting that regular blood flow which is really important uh, and so it's a really good session to be able to come to this and talk to our nurses um, we also have a clinic that we offer to patients. So once patients are 12 weeks post-treatment, so whatever treatment you've had, um, you're able to meet with our clinical nurse one-on-one -on -one, and they can kind of help you figure out where you're at. So um, you've got about three months post-treatment, um, try different variations. Most patients are generally uh, discharged on Cialis. Uh, and that, again, that's to help with the erections and getting blood flow into the penis. Sometimes that doesn't often work, and so um, when you meet with the nurses, they can kind of figure out what's been working and what's not been working. Uh, they talk about, in the education session, they talk about uh, vacuum pumps and penile injections and other different types of medications that you could figure out um, where you're at and what, what you're interested in using. So this is a really good session. Um, the nurses also uh, offer an intimacy workshop that's for couples every three months. Um, and there's three stipulations to this. So one, that you're partnered. Two, that uh, you've seen our sexual health nurse in clinic before the intimacy workshop. And three, that you come to the workshop with your partner. Uh, so if, if you meet those criteria and you're interested in coming to the intimacy workshop, um, it's a, it's a great service to attend. So the lifestyle management uh, module um, is branches out into two themes. The first one is on exercise. So this is where we have a certified exercise physiologist who's available to see you one-on-one -on -one, um, and she'll assess your fitness level and exercise needs. Uh, there's a mandatory education session that's held every month 
And then you have um, appointments one-on-one. -on -one. So you've got baseline one month, which is a telephone follow-up, and then three months, six, six month, and 12 month. Uh, this is a great service to take advantage of. This is like having a personal trainer with you, but she's actually certified in cancer, um, and she would be looking uh, over and seeing what you're doing correctly, what you're not doing correctly. Um, she'll do an assessment when she sees you in clinic, so she'll take anthropometrics like your blood pressure, height, weight, calculate your BMI, um, and figure out like what, what, what have you been doing. So if you've not done anything, uh, it's totally fine. You can still come to the clinic. If you regularly exercise and you want some further assistance, again, you can definitely take advantage of this clinic. Um, and then Sarah Weller, who's the exercise physiologist, um, after she's gathered all that information, figured out if you're at risk for cardiovascular disease or diabetes or anything like that, uh, she takes all that information and designs an exercise prescription for you. So making sure that the exercises that she has for you are safe and that they're, you're incorporating aerobic and strength training as well. So those are two really important components uh, when you're exercising. So, you know, we know from lots of research studies that patients who are uh, in good physical health that have exercise, that regularly exercise tend to do better in terms of recovering from surgery or, or any kind of treatment. Uh, so this is a really good clinic to come to uh, if you're interested in doing that. The second part of our lifestyle management is a nutrition clinic. So we've been kind of revamping our, our nutrition clinic. Um, we actually didn't even have one uh, uh, up until, you know, we're actually starting in January. Uh, we all used to just have an education session that we put on every three months. Uh, we've now received funding with the BC Ministry of Health to be able to have a registered dietitian see you in clinic. It was one of the biggest asks that we would have when we delivered an education session on nutrition. Patients want to see and meet with a registered dietitian to be able to talk to them and figure out how they can improve their diet. So this is uh, a great addition to our program. Um, there is an education session that's every month and then the registered dietitian will see you in clinic and you know you have questions or any kind of uh, dietary needs, you know, she can address them. So recognition and management of treatment related side effects on androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, this is, this module is specifically for patients who are going on hormone therapy. Um, so there's a lot of side effects uh, that are associated with going on hormone therapy. And there's an education session that is being delivered by a nurse practitioner, and he talks about all of the possible side effects. So not to say you're gonna get all of them, but it's good to be aware of side effects you might not know that were, that could be associated <coughs> with uh, being on hormone therapy. Yeah. So uh, it's a monthly education session, and uh, he just tells you what to look out for, what you could be at risk for. Um, and it's a good session to come to. We've also added an ADT clinic as well. So now uh, to help patients manage their side effects, um, there's now a clinic available where a nurse practitioner will see you in clinic. So just talking about the side effects again on androgen deprivation therapy, um, there's lots of different ones. This is just a few of them to list. Hot flashes, weight gain, uh, loss of muscle mass. Uh, we already know that uh, the prostate cancer treatment does affect um, erectile dysfunction. Um, it reduces your libido as well. Um, and there's also um, fatigue and mood that can be affected as well. So lots of different side effects. Um, and it's really important to know that, you know, being on this medication might be a reason why you're feeling tired. So it's not just, oh, you had a long day. It could be from the medication. And it's good to know there's, there's side effects that you can see um, like if you're gaining weight, and then there's other side effects you can't see, like if you're at risk for osteoporosis. Uh, so again, just a good information session to attend if you are going to be on hormone therapy. So pelvic floor physiotherapy for bladder concerns. This is a monthly education session that's presented by a physiotherapist. Uh, she's male certified in pelvic floor. Um, so this is a good session to come to for patients who are 
going to be having surgery, um, but also for patients who are going to be having radiation therapy. We know that patients who are going for surgery, um, it is likely to impact um, incontinence, so you know, with the bladder, and it's important to know that there, there will be some impact, you will be leaking for a period of time. Uh, it really depends on patients too. Sometimes we see patients who leak quite a bit, and there's other patients that we see that don't leak very often. Um, but this is a good session to kind of understand what's happened with the bladder, why, why am I leaking, what are Kegel exercises. Um, Marcy Diane is the physiotherapist who delivers this education session and she talks about the importance of Kegel exercises. Uh, another uh, word for that is male pelvic floor exercises. Um, and she talks about how you should be doing them and how to engage those pelvic floor muscles. Uh, for men, I understand it's, it's kind of difficult to try and figure out which muscles um, are the right muscles to be engaging. Uh, so she gives you some direction in the education session on what to look for. Because uh, half the battle is making sure that you're actually doing the exercises correctly. And then the other half of the battle is making sure you're doing them when you should be doing them. Bending, lifting, coughing, sneezing, pushing, pulling. Uh, when you are 12 weeks post-treatment, um, so we see this again pr primarily in surgery patients. Um, who are impacted by incontinence, but if you are still incontinent after uh, 12 weeks post-treatment, uh, you can come to our physiotherapy clinic, uh, and this is where you can see the physiotherapist one-on-one. -on -one. Under our program, we will, um, we will cover three physiotherapy appointments, so you don't have to use your extended health care plan. And what Marcy does in, in the clinic, she uses something called biofeedback. And there are these little uh, uh, electrodes that she puts in around the rectum area. She gets you to do a pelvic floor squeeze. So it's hooked up to a software on a computer. Um, and when she asks you to do a pelvic floor squeeze, it actually shows on her monitor if you're engaging those muscles correctly. So again, letting her know that you are actually engaging the correct muscles. If you're not, she'll give you more direction on how to do them. So great um, little service there for you to take advantage of as well. Um, patients we generally see that, you know, if they're in, they can be fecal incontinent or there's some incontinence probably two, three years out, um, again, they can take advantage of this clinic as well. So counseling services, this is our last module. Um, we know that from, actually we added this module back in, I believe it was uh, June 2015. Uh, we didn't actually have this module, uh, and we started to see when we first put this program up together that patients were really struggling with the decision-making process, just being diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, there was a lot of anxiety and stress um, and fear from having prostate cancer, and so it was very natural for us to add this module onto our program because it's very important to be able to, you know, address those concerns. So we now have a clinical counselor as of June 2015 um, who you can see in clinic and we will cover three, uh, sorry, six um, clinical appointments for both you and your partner. So you can come together six times or you can each come separately uh, six times each. So it's whatever way you want to do that. Um, please do know that this service is available and lots of patients take advantage of this. Um, and you can take, um, you can come to the clinic at any point in time in your journey, whether you're newly diagnosed or whether you're seeing, you know, post treatment and you are starting to, you know, feel some side effects and you feel stressed about that. Uh, definitely something to take advantage of. So there's other treatment options for localized disease. Um, they include cryosurgery, HIFU, also known as high intensity focus ultrasound proton beam uh, radiation therapy. Um, these aren't offered here in BC. Uh, they're generally offered, I think, um, back east for sure, for HIFU, um, or in the US or in other parts of the country. What we do know is radiation therapy and surgery uh, work best. There's been lots of clinical evidence uh, to suggest that both surgery or radiation therapy, whatever you choose, have very good long-term outcomes. And there's been tons of research to show that over and over again. So while these treatments are new and up and coming, uh, there isn't enough data to suggest that um, those might be superior to 
either surgery or radiation therapy. So it's really up to you to decide what you want to do. Um, those uh, treatments aren't covered as far as I know, uh, so it'd be an out-of-pocket expense. So how do we know whether the treatment is working? So whatever treatment you've had, whether it's surgery or radiation therapy, you're always going to be followed up by your PSA level. So think of prostate cancer kind of like a chronic disease. You're always going to have a PSA level to make sure that that PSA is either zero or close to zero. So with um, patients who are having surgery, uh, you no longer have a prostate, right? And so you, your PSA level should be zero. Um, and that's what the urologist is constantly checking. So you'll get checked every three months, six months, and you know after a period of five years, it might just be every year. Um, with radiation therapy, because the prostate is still inside, it should be very close to zero. So they take a couple average readings and they figure out what your average is from the two readings and they, they use that as a baseline to make sure that your prostate cancer is in check. So if it's zero or close to zero, then we know that the cancer is gone. So what if my cancer reoccurs? Uh, so that's when we start seeing that the PSA level is starting to rise. Uh, and if that's the case, then uh, it's likely you're gonna need an extra treatment. Uh, and depending on what you had as your initial treatment, is what you would have post-treatment. Uh, the options are salvage radiation, uh, salvage prostatectomy, although they very, they, they very seldom do salvage prostatectomy. Uh, there's brachytherapy, um, and there's combinations of using um, hormone therapy as well. That, this decision is really up to your primary provider to decide what's the next step. So clinical trials, we do a lot of clinical trials here at the Vancouver Prostate Center. Uh, it's really helpful for us to understand clinical outcome. Um, you know, there's been, there's been lots of clinical trials done in prostate cancer. Uh, it's kind of now why we know that low-risk prostate cancer, we don't have to treat necessarily. So 25 years ago, you used to have to have surgery or radiation therapy treatment and now we know with doing lots of clinical trials that uh, we could just it's what we call active surveillance or watchful waiting and so you don't necessarily have to have treatment and you would just be getting checks of PSA levels and doing a biopsy every 18 months um, so here at, at the prostate center here uh, we're very big on trying to understand clinical outcomes down the road all the clinical uh, research that we do here is optional to patients um, if you decide you're not interested in participating in any research, uh, it doesn't affect your clinical care at all. Um, so I'm just letting you know that. Um, and you know, if you are interested in uh, clinical trials, you can always contact your physician. Uh, we have a research team here in the PCSC program, and um, we do clinical trials within our own program, and we've partnered with other um, countries around the world to help support their research. Um, and if there are studies that we think that you might be qualified for, um, our research team would be contacting you. If you're not interested in, in participating, that's totally fine. So follow-up visit with your urologist. Um, so this, this is specific to the Vancouver uh, Center here. So Dr. Larry Goldenberg and Dr. Peter Black are the two urologists that do robotic surgery in BC. So. Uh, there's no other surgeon uh, outside of Vancouver that do robotic surgery. Uh, Dr. Allen So is actually in the process of learning robotic surgery, uh, and Dr. Gleave and Dr. Black also do the open um, surgery. For brachytherapy, again, this is specific to the radiation oncologist here, um, Dr. Keyes, Dr. McKenzie, Dr. James Morris, and Dr. Pickles. For radiation therapy, you've got that list there as well. So for further resources, um, I urge you to visit our website at the Vancouver Prostate Center. Uh, there's lots of good information here. Um, you can also check out the BC Cancer Agency. There's lots of, uh, there, you know, we're very tech savvy here now that we all know how to use the internet. You have to be very careful about uh, where you're getting your information from and where that's coming from. So these are two really good, reliable resources that I urge you to check out. If you're interested in um, 
attending a support group, um, you can check out um, prostatecancerbc.ca. Um, they, uh, they have um, support groups in almost every area of the city. Uh, they generally meet the first, either it's a Monday or a Tuesday of the month. Uh, every, every section is different, but you can go on to that link and find a support group that's nearest to you. These are my contact details, so if you have any questions or concerns, you can always contact me um, or you can contact Jenna at 604-875-4495. Um, and we're here to help you as much as we can. So, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we want to help you along your journey. And that's my little bit for this evening. Uh, and now I'm going to introduce uh, Gail, uh, Dale Gamble. He's going to come up here and tell you his experience with prostate cancer. Thank you, Dale. Thanks, Manita. Mm -hmm. Hi everybody, um, you know my name now. Um, I'm here as a volunteer, uh, as a guy who's been down the road that some of you are lined up to go down. And uh, just to give you a quick overview of what's happened in my world uh, and how it's progressed for us and the family and just a few thoughts about ways to deal with this in terms of the sort of the more mental, emotional and social side of it, I guess. Um, my contacts with prostate cancer go back a long way. They go back 50 years, pretty much, and that's because my father had it, was diagnosed in 1969 as a pretty young man, uh, 44. Uh, well, the treatments in 1969 were not nearly what they are today, and men of that era also tended not to talk about what was going on. He didn't, in fact, he didn't even talk to his doctor until it was rather late in the game, and certainly the rest of us in the family didn't know that there was anything going wrong, but he had symptoms, side effects, that he hadn't been discussing with anybody. So he got his treatment, which at that time was a surgical treatment, um, quite, a, quite a different process of surgery than you would get now. And he also had some of the earliest of the hormone therapies. And that worked for a while, but uh, clearly he, he, it had been advanced enough that it didn't eradicate it, because he, he did live another 12 years, but he died at 56, which in my books is a pretty young man these days. Um, and uh, I actually, was free and, and footloose at the age that he was dying. I was in my mid-twenties. And so I was able to, to go uh, back to home and, and nurse him along with my mother's help and, you know, outside nursing help. And so I kind of saw close up the graphic business of what it would be like to, to have that. And it was not, you know, that was not, a, not something I would wish on anybody. So, you know, fast forward ahead, you'd think that, that a, a son, having seen that up close and so on, would pay rather close attention to his own health, but that was not the case. I tended to go on like most 25 to 30 year olds thinking, well, I, it's not going to happen to me. And uh, it wasn't until I got into my early 40s that my GP was pretty savvy and said, you know, given your family history, it would probably be smart to start checking the PSA. So she just put that down for a, a yearly thing for me. I had to actually pay for it at the time, but that was fine. Did that. And sure enough, within a few years, the PSA started to rise. So I won't worry with all the, the, the number details, but basically, fairly quickly, I was in, had the biopsy tests, and uh, was in sitting in the chair facing the urologist with my wife uh, when uh, he says to us, well, you're going the same route as your father, which was a bit of a shock. Because at that time, I'm uh, 46, uh, had just really started a young family, was thinking about other children, a whole bunch of things that would be affected instantly by this, not the least of which, of course, was having my wife sitting beside me thinking, is he going to even be alive in six months? And anyway, we began the treatment, the, the process of deciding that. Um, unlike now, I didn't have choices to make, really. And it's, you know, you, you folks uh, reap the benefits of modern medical research in that there are choices in treatment, although that's hard because then you have to decide. But uh, there wasn't much in the way of options at the time. I could do surgery, uh, and there were competent, capable surgeons right here, because I was in Vancouver, uh, to do that. Um, brachytherapy was, at that time, in the same category as things like this proton beam therapy. It was new. People thought it was a great idea. Uh, they were getting some results, but the data wasn't there. You know, you could, the most they knew was people were doing fine after five years. And at 46, I'm thinking, that's not good enough. You know, like surgery, at least, was saying, you're good for 15. So... And I also would have had to buy the brachytherapy. I would have had to go to Montreal and it was about 20 grand or something like that. I mean, if it had been good, I probably would have done it. But, you know, the, them only being able to guarantee me five years, that, that was not an, uh, an option at all. 
So I went down the route of surgery, uh, combined with some hormone therapy. Um, and, uh, you know, that all happened fairly rapidly. I had a couple of months of hormone therapy. I was in a research study right here at BGH and then had my surgery. Um, again, the surgery was, the surgery had changed since my father's time because we're now talking the 1990s, but it's changed again. And so, so the difference comparing now and then is I was in hospital after for almost a week. And that was because the incision was bigger and other things, you know, they hadn't refined it as much. Um, had a catheter in for close to three weeks. Um, and then probably the recovery period was fairly similar in the end. I, I had to be not doing very much for at least three to four weeks. I recall that at the, th the three-week mark, it was, it was mid to late spring when the weather's getting nice. And about the, th the four-week mark, a friend of mine phoned me and said, do you feel like going for a coffee? And I said, that's a great idea. So she says, uh, I'll come get you. And I said, no, I need to do some walking. I'll, I'll meet you at the coffee shop. So I walked to the coffee shop somewhat slowly. And she wisely drives to the coffee shop because I couldn't walk home. I, it, I was still too, you know, I was pushing it, but I wanted to get, I wanted to recover. But by the time two months had gone by, so we're getting towards midsummer, I was back to enough strength that I, at that time, uh, you know, I was doing things like I, had a, I windsurfed a little bit, you know, not a lot, but I was, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself an athlete, but I would go out in the water and windsurf. And I was able to do that by midsummer, so there was enough healing and strength and so on to do that. And then after that began the long process of, of the, the rest of the recovery, you know. Um, I was fortunate in not having, I didn't leak a lot, incontinence wasn't a big issue, it was a small issue, but it wasn't really a, a big problem. So I didn't really need follow-up surgery on that. Um, erectile dysfunction, impotence, that was, that's, that was difficult. There was no information, no pamphlets, no books, no workshops, nobody to talk to. You guys know what it's like when you see your specialist. They're so darn busy that you don't really get the opportunity to just call them up and say, I'm having this little difficulty here, what can you do? You know, so a year went by and finally I get to talk to the, the urologist about this uh, and uh, say, you know, this isn't so good. And he, so he steered me towards some people, but there wasn't much information. So it took some time and some adjustment. And very gradually over time, what we had, what my wife and I had, started to become a little more normal as a sex life. But there was clear, it was clear we weren't ever going to have any other kids or anything like that. That was now, that horse had left the barn. And then uh, from then on, it was all about uh, monitoring, you know. So PSA, I've had a yearly PSA ever since. I still do. And this is now, as Monita said, it's not quite 25. I'm 23 years in since diagnosis. So I'm close to 70. So I got 23 years cancer-free, as, which is good as far as I'm concerned, and I'm aiming for another 20 or thereabouts, you know, if I'm lucky. <laughs> um, the, you know, one of the bizarre things about all of this is that, that the longer you live, the more likely you are to get something else, right? Mm -hmm. That's gonna, what's, and the, one, the big killer for all of us is this thing. So sure enough, now I gotta look after this, and my car, so I see a cardiologist and a urologist, and I take meds for that. But you know, in the grand scheme of things, that's a small problem as far as I'm concerned. Um, by the way, I'm completely open to questions, just like the doctor say. You ask whatever you th comes to mind. I, I, I don't mind answering any of these questions. Um, there's, a, there's sort of four key things I think I'd like to, to get across. Uh, they, they involve the experience, and I guess one of the things I would say is that, that none of us know exactly what's going to happen when we go through the treatment. You know, uh, there, hopefully it's a high success rate, but we don't all, no one knows for sure what the, how the symptoms are going to be. One thing you can say for sure is that the, you're going to be in a different place when this is all done. It's a bit like, I think of it as a bit like being, uh, the, the medical profession is all on this high-speed train. You get on the train as a patient, they have all this machinery, all this fantastic diagnostic equipment, tremendously skilled surgeons and nurses and other follow-up doctors, and you rocket across the landscape while they do all this amazing work on you in a fairly short span of time. And then the train stops at a station, they boot you off, and that's because there's a big long queue of other people who need treatment and that's what they do. And they kind of boot you off with not a huge amount of information. I mean, you've got this and what you're learning here. But you're now in a different place and you're not going back. That old place is behind you and you can't just go back there. So you now have, you now have to adjust psychologically and emotionally to this new place, to, this, to what your definition of yourself as a man is, to how you relate to your partner, 
uh, just to even what you think about life, you know, what's important to you, those kinds of things. That, that's, that's a shift that, that has to happen or just will happen as a result of it. And so just considering that idea now might be helpful because, you know, you can start to think about who's going to help you with that because it's good to have help. And, you know, if, if you're lucky and have a partner you can talk to, that's great. Most of us have somebody, a family member, maybe a brother or a brother-in-law or a good friend, uh, might be a co-worker, although sometimes these you know, are not things you want to raise at work, but it doesn't really matter where they come from. Having a support network of people close enough to you that you're okay with discussing this is valuable all the way along because at, at the very least it bleeds off some of the tension and strain in your head about what's, what this is all about. And then you come in that conversation to, to make clearer, better decisions about what's the right treatment for you. Um, so yeah, draw on the support that's available from friends and family all the way along if you, as best you can. Um, something you have to watch out for if you're in a, in a close partner relationship, or it could, be, you know, it could even be a brother-sister relationship, you start off when you're diseased and being treated being a patient caregiver relationship. There's nothing you can do about it if it's the wife and husband, the wife automatically goes into the caregiver role and the, and the patient is the patient, obviously, you know, and so that happened to me, of course. The thing is, is that over time, you don't want to stay there. That's, and, and it's a tendency, there is a tendency to, to get sort of mm -hmm. stuck in that, and so what you need to be able to do is keep that in mind that that's, that's for while you're being treated, but you want to get back to the, to the relationship you had before once this is kind of behind you, you know. The reality is, is this new landscape you're in, it's never totally behind you. You know, I always think about it. It's always kind of back here. And every year when it's, the, when it's the anniversary date for my PSA, I'm really thinking about it. And I'm a little bit nervous when I go to the lab, give my blood, and then get online to check my PSA a couple of days later. Because, of course, I'm scared. You know, and I can't do anything about that. Every year I'm scared for that little bit of time. And so, you know, this, this, this process of rearranging your relationship and bringing it back to something normal takes some work, too. It's just something you have to think about. And I guess the last thing that I think is really important to, is, um, and you're, you're getting some of it here, become informed. Find as much as you can, as much as you can take in and understand about this stuff. I had a, a blessing when I had my diagnosis in that I had I had married into a family, I'm not highly educated, but I would married into a family of people <coughs> who, who were, and most of them had studied sciences at university. Well, we sat around the uh, fire over Christmas while trying to help me make a decision about treatment, and they were reading medical abstracts. I don't know if you've ever sat and tried to read one of those, but they're, it, you can do it, but it takes some real work. The terminology is hard to understand, but with, if, you, if you persist. So, you know, finding out what's important for you to know is, is a worthwhile venture. It gives you some power over things, and you feel like you're, you're exerting some control on things. Um, ask questions. You know, be, don't be afraid to ask your doctor, your urologist, your specialist. Fire the questions at them. Go in with a list of questions and go in with somebody with you who will write the answers down. Because, you, you know, you as the patient are a little bit in shell shock. And, well, it's even, the, even the partner can be in shell shock. But if there's two of you, there's a better chance you'll walk out of there with some answers that make sense, recorded somewhere so you can review it and talk about it. Um, <coughs> and the last thing is, start right now, if you haven't already, to do all the other things you can do to maintain your own health. So, you see, I now got this damn thing. And so because of it, I have to, I, I'm required by my cardiologist to do some degree of exercise. Well, we all know it's hard to do. I mean, just life is busy. And, but he, he's there in the background bugging me. If I don't do that, I'm going to die from this long before the cancer comes back. So, you know, it's, it, the things like the exercise program they talk about in here, that's priceless because it's, you know, it's, they're offering it, first of all, for free, for starters, so you can get the, the sort of the hands-on guidance and training to get you started. And then you just connect up with other people who do what you do, whether it's walk or walk run or golf or play tennis or swim or, you know, you find out the things that work for you and then just build them in because then that you're, what you're doing then is you're kind of being an assistant to the surgeon and the, and the radiation oncologist and all the other people who've helped you get over the disease in the first place. So that's pretty much all I've got to say. But has anybody got any questions?